Next up, uh, I've lost my place, is Community and Family Resources. Uh, Ms. Calendar Anderson. I am here. You were there. I, don't, I can only hear you. Uh, you are, are you ready to? Can you not see me? I'm sorry. I'm sure I can if I, I'm lost here on the screen. I can't see you, but I hear you. So let's proceed. All right. Um, and there you are. Uh, are you ready to go? I am trying to share my screen. There we go. All righty. Good evening. I am Beverly Callender Anderson, Director of the Community and Family Resources Department. Thank you for the opportunity to present the department's 2022 budget request this evening. The Community and Family Resources Department helps to improve the quality of life in Bloomington by coordinating programs and services designed to strengthen community engagement and to increase the overall community capacity to address social issues. The CFRD staff work collaboratively with one another, other departments um, and community, part community partners, I'm sorry, to help build a strong and vital community. CFRD operates with nine full-time staff. Um, our divisions include the Bloomington Volunteer Network, which is coordinated by Lucy Shea, the Latino Outreach Programs, which is coordinated by Josefa Madrigal, Safe and Civil City Program under the, direct, the direction of Shatoya Moss, and the After Hours Ambassador Program, which is led by Charles Cole. The department provides support to six commissions, the Council for Community Accessibility, the Monroe County Domestic Violence Coalition, and the Safety, Civility, and Justice Initiative. Michael Shermis and Sue Owens, along with um, some of the other previously mentioned staff, serve as liaisons to these commissions, councils, and coalitions. In addition to the staff name, our department is rounded out by five interns and our extremely talented office manager, Marissa Parr-Scott, who pulls it all together and helps keep us organized. In addition to the programs mentioned in the past 12 months, CFRD has given leadership to anti-racism, equity and inclusion initiatives, shelter and housing and security coordination, and the Future of Policing Task Force. We've planned and implemented over 39 programs and coordinated the selection and presentation of 22 awards for outstanding community engagement. These programs and awards are made possible through the support of corporate sponsors and donations for which we are grateful. I wanna take this opportunity to express my appreciation for the CFRD staff for their creativity and flexibility during this past, I was gonna say year, but really 18 months. Um, they have gone above and beyond to make sure that our programs and initiatives continue, although sometimes they are executed in new ways. I'm gonna share with you some updates on our 2021 budget goals, um, beginning with the COVID-19 response. Um, in response to the pandemic, many of you know that Beacon, Wheeler Mission, New Hope for Families, and Middleway House received a grant to create a safe recovery site for unhoused residents who needed to isolate because of COVID exposure. The city served as the fiscal agent for the grant. Beacon staff operated the safe recovery site from June 2020 to June 2021, and we coordinated meetings first daily uh, and ultimately three times a week. That included shelter providers, city and county staff, BPD, healthcare professionals, and the county health department. These meetings provided opportunities for open and honest communication, increased collaboration, and the sharing of resources. The Safe Recovery site hosted a total of 384 guests throughout that time period it was open. The team found the meeting that are the weekly meetings we were having so beneficial, they requested that we continue after the Safe Recovery site closed in June. And so we continue to meet once a week, continuing to collaborate, communicate, um, share information and share resources. In the area of engagement, the Bloomington Volunteer Network provided free training opportunities for nonprofit volunteer staff in multiple areas, including rec recruiting diverse volunteers, implicit bias, increasing skills in utilizing the Helping Bloomington Monroe resource um, that assists community residents um, 
and then lastly, re-engaging volunteers post-COVID. Uh, you might know that a lot of um, nonprofit agencies were down for volunteers during COVID because they just couldn't have that many people in and out and it was too much of a risk. And so getting those people re-engaged has been really important and even bringing in new volunteers. In the area of diversity, the Latino outreach programs continues to provide Spanish to English and English to Spanish translations for city departments, nonprofit agencies, and Spanish speaking residents with a goal of doing at least 120 translations annually. Staff also responds to about 30 requests per month for its direct service and or resource referral costs for Spanish speaking residents. Uh, Hold on a second. I'm sorry, something is out of out of order. Oh well, I'm just going to keep going. Um, in the area of engagement, no, I said engagement, uh, safety, civility, and justice. Um, you may recall from last year's budget presentation, the downtown um, outreach grants were transferred from BPD to CFRD. Um, and that happened at the beginning of 2021. After revising the grant application process and forming a review committee, grants totaling $208,758 were distributed to local nonprofits working with our community's most vulnerable residents. Um, in the area, of, again, in, uh, diversity, what I missed before was the Black Male Summit took place in 2021. Um, and that was in the fall with 95 African-American and Latino middle and high school age males in attendance. Uh, the Young Women's Leadership Summit, same demographic of African-American Latina, Latina females, um, took place in the spring. And I wanted to point out that although these summits and, and this, <clears throat> both of the summits, focus on um, African-American and Latinas, everyone from the middle and high schools are invited. And so in the past, we have had um, students from all different demographics, even though that has been the focus. Uh, we continue to provide ongoing support to the Future Policing Task Force, which was formed um, as a result of the city's work with the Mortz College of Law's Divided Community Project. The task force is currently examining um, our law enforcement policies and practices, not just BPD, but across the city, across the county, as well as researching best practices around the country. Uh, the task force made some initial recommendations to the mayor recently, um, but then ultimately will come up with recommendations for innovative and creative opportunities uh, for our law enforcement agencies. Um, so now I'll move on to our 2022 budget goals. Um, under engagement, we want to develop a strong and healthy engaged community, of course, by connecting volunteers of all ages and backgrounds um, with creative and effective opportunities for service. And one of the ways we're doing that is developing a strategy to increase the usage of helping Bloomington Monroe uh, by community helpers and users, uh, which will result in enhanced services to residents in need. Um, we recognize and celebrate community engagement through Be More Awards in March and coordinate and promote and host a minimum of two all-age family-friendly engagement opportunities. Um, if you don't know, Helping Bloomington Monroe is a 24-7 a online resource that where people who are either helping someone in need or someone themselves who's in need can access resources and it's very user friendly. Um, we just need to, I think, publicize it a lot more, but it is being used by a number of, excuse me, agencies and organizations across the, um, across the city. And so doing that more um, is one of our goals. In the area of safety, civility, and justice, um, we have a new downtown um, ambassador, after hours ambassador. Um, as I said earlier, 
Charles Culp, and he is, he's been on board for about a month and a half, and he will be working to develop an ambassador volunteer corps, downtown ambassador volunteer corps. And this corps will help monitor the various sectors of downtown um, for cleanliness, noise, people in need, um, and to provide hospitality during large events. Um, you know, it, Charles is there alone now, but it's really impossible for him to cover the whole downtown. So hopefully by having um, a volunteer corps, we will reach more people and be able to keep eyes on more sectors of the downtown. We are, all, sorry, we're also providing coordination and support to the team of seven community members who are overseeing recommendations as part of the Divided Communities Project participation, which includes uh, the implementation of the plan to advance racial equity that was developed as a part of that um, group coming together. And out of that all came the Future of Policing Task Force to which we're providing administrative support as they work to develop this three to five year vision uh, for policing in, in our community. And we're also providing support and leadership to the uh, housing and security group. I think Director Zodi spoke about that earlier. It is being headed up by United Way and the Community Foundation. And so we are working hard to um, give them the resources that they need. In the area of diversity, our Safe and Civil City program staff will coordinate another Young Women's Leadership Summit in the fall. Um, and another Black Male Summit in the spring. Um, as I said, we welcome everyone to those. The department will coordinate annual heritage celebrations, including Juneteenth, Fiesta del Otoño, African American History Month, Latinx Heritage Month, and Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. We also work with Economic and Sustainable Development to coordinate the Blackie Brown Arts Festival which will be coming up soon. And so if you have not saved that date um, in September, around September 15th, I think, I hope that you do. Um, this is where we highlight artists of color and their work in the visual and performing arts. The six commissions along with the councils, coalitions and task forces we support all work very hard. And each of them have a signature program. I'm not going to cover all of their programs, but a few of the upcoming initiatives include a senior focus recognition by the Commission on Aging, which will recognize community members 65 and over and highlight individuals for their accomplishments, resilience in the face of challenge and presence as a role model for others in the community. The Commission on the Status of Children and Youth will recognize four area students um, with swagger awards. And SWAGGER stands for students who act generously, grow and earn respect. And those awards are in the fall of the year. And the Bloomington Commission on the Status of Women has begun advocating for changes in Indiana's shackle law, which requires incarcerated women to be shackled during childbirth. So those are just a few of the things that our commissions are working on. Our budget highlights um, for this request, um, we're asking for a general fund, our general fund request is $1,109,087. This is a decrease of $9,985 or less than 1%. Um, the significant changes are in category one, uh, where the request is $785,447, an increase of about, of 21, thousand ninety five dollars or about three percent um, and as you all are aware the city is requesting a 2.75 salary increase for non-union staff and that's reflected in that number um, in category three which is another significant change the request is three hundred and fifteen thousand dollars seven hundred three hundred fifteen thousand seven hundred and forty dollars which is a decrease of thirty one thousand eighty dollars or uh, a decrease of 32%. And that's reflected in the uh, reduction of $50,000 that we received last year in the 2021 Recover Forward funding, but increases in the, air, in the lines of instruction, dues and subscriptions and grants. So it came out to about 32%. And we don't have any capital overlay. 
uh, capital outlay. And this is our, our budget summary as I just explained it. In addition to the general fund request, we're requesting approval of $125,000 in recover forward phase three funds to help provide job creation opportunities and direct support for some of our community's vulnerable residents and community-wide educational opportunities focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion. The 2022 Community and Family Resource Budget, Department Budget request reflects increases, not that many increases, but a numbers that align with the stated goals of providing opportunities for engagement, promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion, creating a community environment on a foundation of safety, civility, and justice, and providing support to commissions, boards, councils, and task forces. So I thank you for your past support of CFRD programs and initiatives and your consideration of the CFRD 2022 budget request. And I'm happy to entertain comments or answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Director Calendar Anderson. Um, are there question, council questions first round? for the uh, CFRD budget. Councilmember Scambaluri, you can start. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Ms. Calendar Anderson for the updates and, and I am in awe again of what you all do. You also win the award again this year for the best acronym in swagger. Uh, <laughs> so thank you for that. Thank you. Um, Fairly quick question. You spoke about translation services that we offer for um, from English, Spanish, Spanish, English. Have you noticed a need for any other languages? Um, do you have a most, sense of that? Most recently, we did get a request, um, and I can't. I, I know it was an Asian language. I cannot remember which one, but we did get a request. Uh, we referred them to Indiana University. So, but but not a lot um, of requests for other translate late okay. languages translations. Yeah, just wanted to ask the question and keep mm -hmm. that on the radar screen. Um, thank you for your role in selecting uh, the anti-racism training uh, firm that will be joining us. And then, kind of the longer question, um, I think the after hours ambassador position is unfamiliar. Um, to many residents, it's unfamiliar to many elected leaders as well. Could you talk more about that? And could, and could you kind of paint a picture of what Mr. Colt might, ex might do on an ordinary evening? Uh, is it meetings with merchants? Is it walking? You know, what exactly happens in that role? So, yes. So the after hours ambassador um, position is a result of the safety, civility, and justice initiative from three, four years ago, I'm not sure how long ago it was. Um, we, and, and Mr. Culp is our second after hours ambassador. Um, our first one left right as the pandemic was getting started and everything was shutting down. So um, we recently uh, rehired that position. The, the purpose of the position is really to be the eyes and ears of city hall after hours. And so if there is something that people are downtown and, and in need of, I mean, you can always do a U report, but the U report doesn't come until the next day. And so if there is someone who is down there who is identified, uh, people can sometimes get an instant response um, or at least know who they should talk to, um, whether it is the next day or not. The other part is to extend the hospitality of the city. And so when we have large events like Pride Fest or Lotus Fest or Fourth Street Art Festival or what, whatever the event is, um, there will be someone down there to give direction to people who don't know, or even first day of classes, I guess that's another one, but to give direction to people who don't know the city well, who may be looking for particular venues, but also to be eyes and ears for people in need, because we do know that there are a lot of people in need that may not be able to get the assistance that, that they need because either they're they don't know where it is or they're having, you know, some kind of breakdown or anything could be happening. And so he will be, he works with very closely with so, uh, social service agencies, with BPD if needed. Um, he's very familiar with all of the 
uh, Merchants Downtown. He attends the Downtown Bloomington Inc. meetings and mm -hmm. has met the restaurant managers and owners and things like that. And so, um, and that's again, my time. So, oh, I'm so, so sorry. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. I'll follow up in the next round. But thank okay. you for that start. Yeah. Okay, moving along. Who would like to ask the next question? I guess uh, Councilmember Flaherty. Thank you, appreciate it. And thank you, Ms. Calendar Anderson uh, for the presentation. I uh, had two, two questions um, or two, two areas. Uh, one uh, was just on the future of policing task force. Um, we, we heard a bit about uh, some recommendations, I think in the first night of presentations uh, from Mayor Hamilton. Are, are those meetings public uh, and available to attend or, or what's, what's the status with those? Um, well, it's not a commission, and so we, I mean, we haven't made them public. We haven't said that people couldn't attend, so I, it's not a question I've had before, council member. Um, so I'm, I'm sure if someone wanted to attend or ask questions, they, they certainly could. I, t I will tell you, though, the way we've been meeting, and we have been meeting once a week throughout the summer, um, the big group meets um, one week, and then the next week subcommittees meet, so um, it would just, we just need to post those larger meetings so that people could attend and give input. Got it. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, the second one um, was, I was going to follow up on some things related to accessibility. I, I believe the Council on Community Accessibility is under your department and, and staffed by Mr. Shermis. Um, they recently put on a, a, a really great event uh, down at um, the Pavilion at Switchyard Park that Councilmember Smith and I both attended. Uh, and, and A, that was just uh, terrific, very well done. Um, and you. a lot of city staff were attending. Um, but I wanted to ask more specifically about accessibility and ADA compliance issues and how your department interacts with those, um, as well as uh, where funding for addressing those types of needs lives in the city. Maybe it's in a mixed uh, variety of places, but have, in your experience, has CFRD ever um, had funding to address where we have accessibility gaps or, or ADA compliance issues? So we will, uh, what CFRD does is to besides resourcing for the public, if you're, if you're talking about internally, um, we survey locations, so fire departments, police departments, public buildings, all of that. And so we will do the surveys um, for ADA compliance. Um, and then the department itself is responsible for making any corrections. So we don't have the funding to make corrections, but we, we act in an advisory capacity. Um, then the department is responsible. There's a real concern about members being in Okay, I was thinking about um, uh, signal interchanges in particular um, at, at traffic intersections, uh, which we encountered on um, uh, the walking tour that, that my group did. Um, so I guess that would interact with, with public works and your, your department would advise on some of that with public works, is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, additional questions for Director Calendar Anderson? Uh, Councilmember Piedmont Smith. Yes, thank you. Um, I had a question uh, about uh, adding a program specialist position um, in your uh, budget memo it, under um, safety, civility, and justice. It says mm -hmm. add program specialist, but I didn't see that that was a newly funded position. So. so it's not a newly funded position. We have a position open right now. So we have nine funded positions and eight people on staff currently. Um, and so that was a position that was approved actually earlier this year or late last year, I think, um, that we have not hired for yet. Okay. Um, well, I have time left. Let me see if I have another one for you. <laughs> Um, that's it for now. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I'll pose a question. Uh, Ms. Calendar Anderson, you, you were instrumental in um, finding, working to uh, find a winter shelter uh, last year. Winter's not so many months away. I, I wonder what are the prospects for a low barrier winter shelter? So as I said in my, in my presentation, the shelter directors and I and BPD, all that group are still meeting. We have not talked about um, a larger winter shelter yet. We are working with 
uh, Wheeler Mission to keep the women's the women's shelter open um, through August of 2022. Um, and so, so that we know that that will be one resource that will remain open, but we haven't had discussions yet about a low barrier shelter, um, but it's, uh, you're right, winter is not that far away and, and it is something we'll be discussing. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, okay, further questions from council? In the CFRD budget, oh, sorry, uh, council member Skimbaluri. Yes, we're in round two now. I take it. We apparently are. Okay. Um, thank you. And Ms. Callender, I understood back to uh, our conversation about the after hours ambassador. Um, if I'm an ordinary person coming downtown, where would I find him? Or, or are there office hours? Or so, are there yeah. meetings scheduled? So he, so the after hours ambassador is in the office actually, Monday, Tuesday. Tuesday and Wednesday, I'm sorry, Tuesday and Wednesday. And then he is downtown after hours, Thursday, you Friday. You mean at Saturday. City Hall? You at mean... City Hall, yes, I'm sorry. Okay. Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and usually on foot. And he is in uniform, and the uniform has after hours ambassador on it. Um, but hopefully by bringing this volunteer corps, you won't have to just look for him, that there will be many after hour ambassadors. You know, and that's, and that's the whole point of the volunteer corps because we know he can't be everywhere. And so he may be, you know, anywhere along Kirkwood or Walnut or college, you know, just um, where he might be needed at a particular time. Got it, thank you. Yeah, um, and I'm sorry, Councilman, I, I will say that he does carry um, a cell phone. And so his cell phone number is available, which of course I don't have right now, so I can't put it in the chat. But if anybody wants to have it and all the downtown businesses have it, um, they can get that number and call him. And so he's readily available by cell phone. Got it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I also uh, appreciate Council Member Flaherty's question about the future policing task force. So thank you for bringing that up. So much appreciated. Thanks. Okay, um, we're on second round questions. Are there any questions remaining? Uh, Council Member Piedmont Smith. Yes, actually, I, I wanted to follow up on Councilmember Flaherty's question. Uh, so it wasn't quite clear to me from your answer. So are the meetings public? I mean, are they posted somewhere? Can people go and observe uh, what the task force discusses? And so so they, I guess they can. I mean, they're not closed meetings. It's just that that question just had never come up before. That, that was what I was saying to Councilmember Flaherty. It's never come up before. And, and um, so we can, yeah, we'll definitely have, the meetings are posted on our, I don't know if they're posted on our website, um, council members, so I will make sure that they are. Though. Because they're, okay. and of course they're Zoom meetings, we haven't been meeting in public yet. Yeah, I think that would be very helpful to post those. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, you probably have time remaining, although the timer's not working. Do you have anything else, council member? Okay, um, anyone else? Not seeing, I'm seeing shaking heads. So let us now proceed to uh, Mr. Lucas, uh, public comment. Yes, and apologies for the timer, too many, too many things <laughs> going on at once. Sure. Um, uh, for members of the public that uh, might wish to comment, uh, please use the raise hand function to indicate that you'd like to speak. Uh, you can click on the participants button to find that. Uh, some folks may need to click the more button to find uh, the raise hand. Um, and I believe some users can find that under the uh, reactions tab. If you've called in, I think you can dial star nine to, uh, to raise your hand. Uh, if all of, all of that fails, uh, you can send a message uh, via chat to let us know you'd like to speak. Are you seeing any? This is public comment on the Community Family Resources Department 2022 budget. I do have a comment. I'm not sure if it's uh, one that 
uh, the individual would like me to read. Uh, I'll go ahead and assume it is. Uh, this is from the uh, uh, screen name B square. The comment reads regarding the status of the future of policing task force when it was formed. I asked the question about its status under the open door law. The response from Philippa Guthrie was, hi, Dave, a task force set up by the mayor is not subject to the open door law. It is different from a commission established by the council. These meetings will not be officially noticed and will not be open to the public. The mayor is not a member of the task force and will not attend meetings as this is intended to be a community led effort. Thanks. And that is the end of the comment. And I do not see any additional requests for comments at the moment. Okay. Then let's return to council for any additional questions or final comment. If, if I could, Council Mabarella, I'll say that the after yes. our ambassador number is in the chat. So oh. um, it was his number and email address were, was placed in the chat. Very good. Thank you. Th thank you. I see that now. Um, additional questions or, or final comments on the CFRD budget? Uh, sorry, uh, Councilmember Sandberg, I missed you. Thank you. I don't have any questions, but I do feel the need to make a comment. Um, as uh, Mr. Crowley led the effort, the um, uh, recover forward effort during the pandemic for the business community, uh, Beverly Callender Anderson led it admirably for the social services community. And um, I, I just want to give praise to you, Ms. Callender Anderson, for your um, just your calming temperament when you are working with individuals in this very, very difficult environment. And when I think of safe and civil, I absolutely think of you and, and just what a bridge builder you are with all the different competing interests and all the different conflicts that we have had over the past 18 months. So uh, as I support uh, your budget, uh, full, part, full, full throated yes to your budget, I think it is very, um, very appropriate that we give you credit for working in this, this area. Thank you. No, thank you, I appreciate that. Further council comment? Uh, I don't see any. Uh, Ms. Calendar Anderson, thank you very much for that presentation, all the good work that you do. Um, do we have a recommendation for the CFRD budget? Recommend do pass. Second. All right. Uh, we'll start with uh, Councilmember Scambaluri. Yes. Councilmember Sandberg. Yes. Councilmember Piedmont Smith. Yes. Councilmember Volan. Yes. Councilmember Smith. Yes. Councilmember Flaherty. Yes. Councilmember Sims. Yes. Council President Sims, pardon me. Uh, Council Member Rosenberger? Yes. And I vote yes. That is a due pass recommendation of 9 0. Thank you again, Director. Thank you. Now we turn to uh, Parks and Recreation budget for 2022. Uh, Director McDevitt? Good evening. Can you evening. see me and hear me? Yes, it's working. Okay. Like it when it works. Okay, let me just do a quick test here. And okay, I am ready to go. Please proceed. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Paula McDevitt. I am the director of the Bloomington Parks and Recreation Department, and I am honored to be here this evening to present the Parks and Recreation Department's 2022 budget. The Parks and Recreation Department strives to provide the highest quality parks, recreation services, and green space to enhance the quality of life in our community. And this work is done by our 56 full-time employees and 60 full-time equivalent seasonal employees. Our work is done in four divisions, and I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce our division directors, uh, Rebecca Higgins, who's our recreation division director, Tim Street, our operations and development division director, 
John Turnbull, our Sports Division Director. And also joining us tonight on the call is uh, Park Board Member Israel Herrera, who's also the Park Board Representative on the Plan Commission. And I'd also like to recognize Kathleen Mills, Ellen Rodkey, and Jim Whitlatch, who are the other members of the Board of Park Commissioners. I'd also uh, like to thank them for their time and their continual support of the department. And I'd also like to recognize the members of our Bloomington Parks Foundation who also support all that we do in the Parks Department. I'd like to also thank um, our Parks Department staff who have worked tirelessly through the ups and downs of the pandemic. They are true professionals day in and day out, and I am proud of the work that they do every single day. And you will see their work reflected in our presentation tonight. This slide uh, indicates the major initiatives that we work on every day throughout the year. This diorama is a quick look at all of the assets that we manage, and we currently manage just over $84 million in assets. The department has been accredited by the Commission for Accreditation and Parks and Recreation Agencies since 2001. We go through the reaccreditation process every five years, and I am very pleased to announce that we successfully completed our reaccreditation process this past June by meeting all 154 standards of operations with a perfect 100% score. Last year, we were the recipients of two sizable grants um, addressing food security and nutrition. And this year, we have been the recipients of three awards in our urban forestry area. The master plan process occurs every five years and it's a requirement of our accreditation status. Uh, in 2020, it was certainly a challenging time to undertake the master planning process. So we hired a consultant who guided the process virtually. One of the most important tasks of the master plan process was the community interest survey. We had 531 survey responses and 156 paper surveys. We uh, spoke to 87 stakeholders representing 25 different community groups, and we read 557 open comments from the surveys. The results of this input, along with the latest trends in the field, of field and benchmarking against similar communities, results in the master plan goals for 2021 through 2025. The next few slides represent some critical community feedback used to develop some of the 2022 budget requests. This first slide, um, the top three facilities used, no surprise, walking and biking trails, large community parks and green space and natural areas. The top three social and cultural programs include the farmer's market, arts and cultural events and concerts. When we asked what prevents residents from using parks and recreation services, the number one answer was not enough time. Personal safety concern, the park or trail is not safe or my neighborhood does not have a park recreation facility or trail within a 10 minute walk. Customer satisfaction is a key indicator of how well the parks department manages operations from programs to maintenance and projects. 83% total indicates people are satisfied and very satisfied with the value that they receive. And finally, the top three most important issues that the department must address, connecting trails, focus on maintenance and reducing vandalism and address safety. The master plan was reviewed and approved by the Board of Park Commissioners in February. These four goals represent the framework for the next five years. Each goal has several strategies which staff use to formulate a five-year strategic action plan. No doubt the Parks Department was affected by the pandemic. Over hundred programs were canceled, facilities shut, including our playgrounds. However, it was very clear the role the Parks Department has in public health. The community turned out to use parks and trails in record numbers. Trailheads had overflowing parking lots as people sought out green spaces, trails, and fresh air to maintain their physical, mental, and social health. Tennis experienced a resurgence and the golf course remained open with protocols in place, completing the year with 28,000 rounds of golf surpassing the past four year totals. 2021 has been a year of recovery and moving forward with continued protocols and safety measures in place. And the results are we were able to open camps with, however, with reduced capacity, our pools opened and the concert and community events have returned. Of note, tennis lessons have experienced a 500% increase where we used to have 15 participants per tennis lesson session. We had well over a hundred per session. 
And the golf course currently is seeing a 13% increase in 18 full rounds of golf. In the area of sustainability and climate change practices, several members of our staff from natural resources, landscaping, health and wellness, community gardens and market contributed to the city's 2018 sustainability action plan. Areas in the plan that Parks is working on include habitat restoration, tree planting, community gardens, storm emergency planning, adopt a stream, acre and trail programs, invasive plant removals, restoration projects, composting at community gardens, and conversion to electric maintenance equipment and partnerships such as the one we have with Monroe County, identify and reduce invasive species to develop and implement invasive plant education and training events. And of course, we've gone solar. I believe we're in our third or fourth year of solar panels. And to date, um, we have realized 20, over $28,000 in savings. And you can see Twin Lakes leads, leads the pack there, but they also have um, the most uh, solar panels and a big flat roof. Uh, in equity, diversion, and inclusion, our master plan has outlined four strategies that we are working on. Our strategic action plan items that we initiated already in 2021 include our partnership with community organizations as part of the cultural hub at Vanderford Community Center, included hosting El Mercado Monthly, and our plant truck project partnership. We have a diversity in musical entertainment in the performing arts series, and we have identified four priority areas in underserved communities for the Bicentennial Bond Tree Planting Project. Bias training has been completed by all regular full-time staff, and I'm happy to announce a brand new uh, community event at Farmer's Market, Harvest of the World on September 25th, that will emphasize and celebrate uh, the diversity of music and food. Every 16 years, the Parks Department is eligible to bond in order to catch up on deferred maintenance projects and new projects. We are in the final year of a five-year general obligation bond, which started in 2017. The next few slides are Parks general obligation projects completed in 2021. The first picture is the Pine Course at Cascades Golf Course. So now all three whole, all nine whole courses are now complete with Zoysia Turf. We also researched, resurfaced the tennis course at Bryan Park. We replaced the playground at Reverend Butler Park. We replaced the lighting along the Winslow Sports Complex Trail. We are currently replacing the playground at Winslow Woods Park. And we are working on a resurfacing project of the Bryan Park Fitness Trail with a contract uh, due this fall. Other projects we're working on, we are managing through the Bicentennial Bond Project package. Um, our trail projects include an east-west trail that will have a trailhead on Rogers Street across from the Switchyard Park. The Griffey Loop Trail, bids came in last Friday and are currently being reviewed with the contract uh, to be signed yet this fall. Designs for two gateways have been completed. Miller Showers is the North Gateway location and Twin Lakes Sports Complex is the West location. Um, in 2022, we will work on the cost of the projects with a 2023 construction. And the Lower Cascades Park Road improvements, staff recommended in May of this year to reopen the 0.6 mile stretch of the road through Lower Cascades, creating a slower new use of the road to, for, to a more passive experience for all visitors to the park. Our bicentennial tree planting project staff have identified 552 potential vacant tree planting spots in four different designated project areas in the city. These project areas were identified using a combination of available locations for tree plantings, socioeconomic data, and tree canopy cover percentages that match closely to the National Explorer Tree Equity Score for these areas. <clears throat> Now briefly, the next slides are a snapshot of the status of our 2021 goals. I am challenged in this section to only select a few, but it's important to know that each program area has many goals reflected in our 2021 Trello cards. So as I stated, we have already uh, completed our reaccreditation and community relations is well on their way to their sponsorship goal. In operations, we are managing through incidents of graffiti. We're planting native plants planting trees and natural resources unveiled their outer spatial mobile app in April and the cemeteries planted roses. In the recreation division, we've hosted fitness classes at Switchyard Park, 
community uh, gardens rented all 241 community garden plots this year. Allison Jukebox is beginning to ramp up their facility rentals now that the COVID um, restrictions have been lifted a bit. And Banneker hosted a block party for 250 people this summer um, and have hosted four El Mercado events. And Food Truck Fridays and Friday night concerts at Switchyard Park are a hit. So we are well on our goal to uh, meeting 2,000 to 3,000 people on a Friday. Aquatics, as I mentioned, we are able to open the pool. So working on those attendance figures. Uh, Community Sports Services hosted three uh, rentals at the fields. And Frank Southern, while we opened it last year, we had to shut down the facility due to COVID earlier this year, but we are on schedule to open this October. Golf ser services, as I mentioned, uh, golf business is brisk and we are on our way to meeting our goal. We've already rented the clubhouse 38 times and Twin Lakes is recovering from being closed down in 2020 with new registrations. Youth services was able to secure a partnership with uh, Bloomington Football Club to meet capacity needs at Winslow Sports Complex. So now turning to our 2022 budget goals. Again, I could only pick one goal for each area, so we will just move through these. Uh, administration, we'd like to get all of our seasonal staff on the time track system. And community relations is, has a very robust social media presence. So working on gaining more followers, uh, we have a little over uh, 3,200 followers on Instagram and a little over 11,000 Facebook followers. In operations, we would like to purchase an enterprise asset management software package to manage the $84 million of assets that we're responsible for, initiate a contract for bridge inspections and replace a shelter house at RCA Park. In landscaping, continue our bare root native hardwood planting program in various locations. And in the cemeteries, we would like to open a scatter garden and expand our green burial area. In urban forestry, forestry, continue planting trees and pruning and conduct some community educational events to focus on the proper pruning and planting and tree care on private property. And natural resources, continuing our ever popular MCCSC uh, outdoor education program and complete a prescribed burn at Lake Griffey Nature Preserve and conduct some formal wetland delineation work at various natural resources locations. At Banneker, um, they have developed a nutrition hub. So now they are starting with the programming. So moving our popular get on board active living education program there and garden programs and health and wellness introduce a punch press system for the Switchyard Park fitness programs. Community events would like to focus on increasing the number of farm vendor contracts from 55 to 65, increase the number of food beverage artisans from seven to 12 and collaborate with the community and family resources department on a new community event. At Switchyard Park, we're going to keep moving ahead with attracting lots of participants and aiming for 440 events, programs and rentals. Allison Jukebox, focusing on facility rentals, increasing participation both at Kid City Break Days and Kid City Camp, and with uh, expanding services for inclusive recreation participants. Golf services, again, the word, key words are increase, increase, or recover, so increasing the 18 rounds of golf played and driving range participation, and Frank Southern, increasing public session attendance and user group hourly rentals. Ryan Park continuing recovery with daily attendance at both pools and Twin Lakes Rec Center again recovering uh, facility rental hours and our youth basketball registrations. Uh, community Sports Services host a national tournament which we weren't able to do this year because of COVID and continue our field rentals and to install a futsal court at Building Trades Park. So focusing on our budget highlights, category one, we have a request of 6296244 our 9% increase. Uh, line category, uh, line 111 is for our full-time and union employees. And line 112 is for our seasonal staff. We will be paying the living wage of 1401 to a high of 1595 an hour and an increase the number of seasonal positions in Switchyard Park and landscaping budgets. In category two, request of approximately 624,000. This is largely due to the cost, the rising cost of goods. 
and the slide indicates budget expense lines and program areas with increases. Category three, a uh, request of approximately 2 million 400 or a 17% increase. Um, again, uh, cost of services going up and the slide highlights budget expense lines and program areas with increases. Uh, line uh, 311 there in cemeteries is the uh, uh, construction documents for the scatter garden. Uh, we have water and sewer. Our, our water rates are going up and those are all facilities uh, where we use a lot of water. And our lease payments for our solar panels are also in category three. In category four, capital, our request is 344,000. We did not have any capital requests in uh, the 2021 budget. And these lines indicate the program areas where our capital requests are coming from. Again, the futsal court and Park Ridge East court repairs, uh, cemeteries, we need to reasphalt all the interior roadways at Rose Hill. This has been a budget request for several years. Um, community events, a new cargo van for all the events and to retire a very, very old van. Uh, golf services, again, uh, increased business out there. So some equipment and Switchyard Park, uh, the need for a mower. And in uh, line 451, community events, some bollards at the market entrances at the city hall site. And finally, the Recover Forward Phase 3. Uh, this funding is a little over a million dollars, and it will go uh, primarily to operational revenue replacement for our revenue loss in 2020, and also towards a new green jobs program that we're really excited about that uh, will uh, be supporting services and tasks in our urban forestry and landscaping divisions. This work will focus on sustainability, invasive species management, job training and career exploration. And we have a staff member who um, actually had this experience running a similar program in her previous position. So uh, really uh, learning a lot about the potential for this program um, from that staff member. Uh, so in summary, the 2022 budget request for the Bloomington Parks and Recreation Department is 9,723,349. And that's an increase of a million 304,141, or a 15% increase. And our uh, ARPA fund summary is uh, just over a million dollars. And so in conclusion, our budget reflects uh, the funding that aligns with the stated program goals uh, that we learned and were driven by our master plan process and our community survey, um, and focusing in on our, our programs, events, volunteer opportunities, lots of ways for the community to be involved, sponsorship opportunities so that we can continue to offer free concerts and low cost or no cost community events, managing the $84 million in assets, health and well-being, and the role that we play in our community's health, equity and access to parks, programs, and facilities, maintaining all the parks and trails and facilities, capital improvement projects, trees and landscaping, natural resource management and sustainability initiatives. So I'd like to thank you for your ongoing support of our department in the past and all that we do. Um, and thank you for your consideration of the Parks and Recreation 2022 budget request. And I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Director McDevitt. Um, we will go to council questions now for a Parks and Recreation budget for 2022, who would like to begin first round questions? Any takers? Council member Piedmont Smith. Yes, thank you very much for your presentation, Ms. McDevitt. Um, this question may be for uh, the controller, uh, Mr. Underwood, if he's uh, on the call, and he usually is. Um, can you review for us uh, the Parks General Fund, how that's funded? Is that an extra layer of property tax or how, how does that work? Uh, they are one of uh, two, uh, three operating funds to get property taxes, uh, City General Fund, Parks General Fund, and then the uh, Cumulative Capital Development Fund, which has a property tax rate and then uh, our general obligation bond. Across the property tax. So 
uh, in the parks department, uh, they primarily property taxes. Uh, I believe their levies uh, between seven and $8 million. Uh, and get you the exact figure. And then um, they get some miscellaneous state revenues, not a lot. And then the rest is program fees. And is that um, just a, uh, a fund that all um, class two cities in the state have, or at some point did we create that here in Bloomington? There's actually two statutes uh, in the state where parks departments can get created. Uh, and ours is uh, one that gives them some additional flexibility and actually greater range. That's was that gave them the ability at one point to operate out at Lake Lemon. Uh, so ours is a more uh, larger um, state statute that it was operated on. So it's either one or the other, uh, and they do get pro a property tax uh, levy as part of that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And now for Ms. McDevitt, um, uh, one new goal of, uh, program caught my eye in your budget um, is to construct a remote control car track feature in Switchyard Park. Um, can you uh, let us know how much uh, you expect that to cost and how that was decided upon as a good idea to do? Um, sure, I will uh, have to get back to you on the exact cost of it, but uh, it's really come from the fact that a lot of people are bringing remote control cars to Switchyard Park and are running them uh, down the main entryway, what we call the platform area. And as you all know, the park is full and there are people going every direction and running and biking and that. And it's just to have a designated area where this activity can take place. But I'll be happy to get uh, the exact cost of that to you. Yes, please do. Thank you. Okay, further questions? Oops, going wrong way. I don't see any, perhaps I'll take one. Oh, Councilmember Flaherty, you have a question. If you put your hand back, it'll be in focus. Yep. <laughs> it seems to have a hard time no matter what. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Ms. McDevitt, for the presentation. I wanted to ask uh, for more of an explanation on something you mentioned under the, under the sustainability portion, which was uh, conversion to electric maintenance uh, equipment. Uh, I assume that means string trimmers, uh, blowers, lawn, lawn care equipment. Um, can you tell me maybe what progress we've made in terms of percent of uh, equipment uh, uh, converted and what our timeline on total conversion is and what the policy is. Is it automatic at time of replacement? Is it uh, subject to some sort of uh, cost analysis um, or we're willing to pay a premium but not you know, so much? And if that's all far too detailed for, for this uh, and you'd rather follow up via writing, uh, you can just say so and that's okay too. Well, I, I would be able to give you all of that in, in writing, um, but I can tell you it is definitely something that we talk a lot about in planning this budget. It was when it's time to replace, it will be replaced with a battery operated piece of equipment. So we're not um, going back to um, old practices. So it is in the forefront of when it's time to retire or replace what is the best way to do that? And so it's, it's definitely part of our plan, um, but I'd be happy to give you, you know, total numbers. We have an extensive equipment inventory list and how old it is and when it's up for replacement and what we've, been re and what we've replaced it with. But as you cite, the trimmers um, are in several budgets. Uh, I believe it's in landscaping operations and cemetery. They are all due for new ones and they're being replaced um, with, with these battery operated electric ones. Thank you. And how about the uh, switchyard park mower that was mentioned in, in capital expenses uh, for this year? Um, I, I will look at what the model is that they're looking at and, and um, be happy to provide that to you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, just to follow up, Director McDevitt, I, I was going to ask a similar question. I'm glad that Councilmember Flurry posed it. And that is um, because there's consideration of uh, limiting the, the amount and use of gas-powered um, commercial equipment in, in the city because of, of pollution concerns and noise and so forth. So we need to take play our part. Is there a possibility of a time estimate? I know that you've described this as phasing out, but is that possible to maybe put some kind of time parameters on the, on, on the anticipated phasing? 
Well, I, I tell you, we are working on our strategic action plan, and this is part of that. And uh, um, each division has has their areas, so that would certainly be a good place for that to land. Um, I think you all understand as well that equipment that we purchase last a very, very long time. So I know that we do have some mowers, so we have mechanics that keep our mowers and equipment going so that we get you know, long use out of them. So again, um, our equipment inventory would show us how old the piece of equipment is, when it's ready for replacement, and then what our plan is. But uh, I think that could be nicely folded into our strategic action plan. And our strategic action plan accreditation standards require us to report to our board of park commissioners um, annually, sometimes we do it twice a year, just where we are on achieving those tasks in that particular year and the progress that we're making. And it's, it's pretty detailed who's assigned to it um, and the timeline and what the task is. So I will make a note and uh, be happy again to, to provide a comprehensive um, inventory on where we are with this equipment. Thank you, that's very helpful. Um, okay, further questions? Um, I don't see any, so I'll take another one. Uh, so, you know, unfortunately we're suffering, that is, I suppose the planet is suffering from a biodiversity crisis. And so I, I'm interested in the ecological integrity of Griffey Preserve, I've been for a long time. And I wondered what the status of plant surveys and deer management was there. Great, thank you for the question, Council Member Rallo. Um, as you know, um, we are, have a deer management program. Uh, we have a contract with Ecologic who is doing uh, the monitoring of our plants and um, Steve Cotter oversees that and Rebecca Swift. So we do have that information that we can um, provide. I can tell you that um, ecologically, um, some plants are recovering quicker and better than others. Um, however, we um, look at that data every year and determine um, whether we are going to have another CHAP hunt, that's the Community um, Hunt Access Program. And uh, we did one last year and we plan to have another one again this year um, because we have to, to keep that progress going. Um, but again, uh, Ecologic is the, the company on contract that does all of that work for us. and. Uh, Happy to provide you more specifics on that. Um, the um, burns that does in our, uh, the controlled burn program is also part of that. And we did that very successfully last spring. Um, that was in partnership uh, with our local fire department. And um, it was so successful. We have another burn scheduled this fall. And then in 2022, which is in the budget, uh, either fall or either spring or fall. Again, it's very weather dependent and the conditions and all of that, but we go ahead and, and get a contract in place because when it's ready to go, it, it's go time. So there's a lot of efforts going on. Um, we also have a uh, pretty um, detailed invasive management, plant management program there. I mean, it's just, <laughs> it, that's just taken a really long time. We have all kinds of volunteer groups out there when we have the opportunity to have a large volunteer group, they do that. We, um, again, with our partnership with um, MC Iris making progress and they have done some work out there as well. So it's pretty comprehensive, um, but you know, happy to compile that and, and share that with you. But uh, as you know, um, our Environmental Resource Advisory Council, full of talented um, professionals in the field that guide our work um, and they, they meet on a very regular basis and um, give us guidance and, and support and, and, and feedback as we manage that, that property. Uh, that sounds wonderful. I'd be very interested in the information and would you know, love to hear from Ms. Swift or Mr. Cotter if they'd like to present it to council. Um, Absolutely. And um, I, I would personally, I, I would be in favor of any restoration efforts as well, if those are needed there, because I know the damage has occurred for some time. So uh, let's move on to further questions for Director McDevitt. Am I seeing any? Uh, Councilmember Flaherty, yes. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I also wanted to follow up. Um, about some current concerns related to the, the Cascades Trail um, improvements. Uh, 
the, the city's transportation plan calls for a multi-use path from College Avenue up to Clubhouse Drive and, and actually all the way to Bloomington High School North. Um, I think of that as a pretty important piece of the um, commuting puzzle for students, which is something that the council committed to in resolution 1911 uh, from the YES Society, Youth for Environmental Sustainability Society. They asked for safe, um, separated, well, safe biking facilities to, to schools. And that's the most obvious route to Bloomington High School North. Um, so when that bond was authorized in 2018, uh, it was for a trail to continue the trails that already exist. And my understanding of the current decision is that um, we're looking at maybe traffic calming on the road, um, which just isn't the same thing. It's not an all ages and abilities facility. It doesn't follow the transportation plan. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering kind of A, why that wasn't brought to council since we were the ones who authorized the bonds. Um, and B, you know, what the implications are for the budget in the future if we're gonna follow the transportation plan. I, a constituent has mentioned a few times in our meetings that um, most or all of the money from the bond may be being spent on other improvements in Cascades Trail. So I was looking for maybe, in the, sorry, in Cascades Park. So I wanted to ask about an update on that front. It seems to me like we, we will likely not be able to deliver on what was promised in the bonds that were authorized uh, to the council. So I just was asking for some clarification on all that. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you for the question. Um, I will answer um, part of the question and then um, I believe uh, our, uh, Mr. Underwood uh, can fill in um, part of the, the financial piece on that. So um, you, are, you are correct and, and, and duly noted the transportation plan. And uh, as you know, we have a lot of work and um, opportunity down in Lower Cascades and we have put several trails down, connecting trails. You can get to the dog park from there. You can get up Clubhouse Drive. Our current project um, down there is building an accessible trail that takes you back to the waterfall and then a creek improvement project. So that project is being funded through uh, general obligation bond projects. And then the bicentennial bond package of, that you referenced um, was for the Lower Cascades uh, Road. So again, those are plans. Those were um, suggestions. That's the direction um, that was suggested that we should take a look at. And as we do, we uh, invite public input and we try things. And that is what most of, you know, a year and a half was the pilot project that got a lot of attention. And in that process, uh, we learned a lot. Um, we learned about how different ways that road is used. And so what we uh, recommended and, and the path that we are currently pursuing is changing, um, slowing down the traffic that goes through that park and the, the traffic calming devices will do that. Um, I believe it will be safer and a, a quieter, calmer experience for people, whether you're on a bike or driving through that portion of the park. Um, there is opportunity, I mean, and our door is open to, we have never experienced it in this way. And um, it's, it's middle of the ground there and that is what we are pursuing. Um, as far as use of the bicentennial bond funding towards uh, sorry, the sorry accessible to, trail. Oh, just, that's, we oh. are at time. I wanted to double check uh, with the chair if, if someone else wanted to take up the question or, or if, if Ms. McDevitt could continue. Are, Apologies. I, well, I, I, were you close to finishing? Because this is- I am. I have two more sentences. Just yeah, to say yeah. um, uh, quickly that um, using the bicentennial, some of the funding for the from the bicentennial bond for the, the accessible trail project. Uh, that was done with approval and review from um, Bond Council um, with the help of uh, Mr. Underwood. Thank you. Um, further questions? Uh, I don't see any, uh, Councilmember Piedmont Smith. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on Councilmember Flaherty's question. So um, the bicentennial bonds, uh, were they for a trail connection uh, through Lower Cascades? And now that's been converted to being a traffic calming project. Did I understand that correctly? Correctly, uh, yes. And as I said, it was a, a plan to, to make that connection happen. Um, it was a plan that was discussed uh, internally 
And uh, we took it and got public feedback and tried our pilot project, which uh, gave us a lot of information um, for what, what is the best use for that, that, that road and how people like to use the road. And uh, we have a lot of uses, and that's one of the challenges that we face as, as a department is trying to meet the needs of the entire community. And, and through that, that pilot process, we listen to the, the walkers and the bicyclists and the people that have no other way to slowly enjoy the park, but to drive through slowly. So um, all of that informed our decision. We also heard how cars race through there. So we wanna slow that down and make it a more passive quiet. I equate it to when you visit a state park and you drive through the grates, it all calms down and everyone moves slower and more passively through the park. Thank you. Okay, looking for further council questions. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll pose one related to um, uh, Director McDevitt. You you mentioned that six, I think it was sixteen and a half percent of your survey respondents indicated that safety concerns were discouraging them from using parks. And so I wanted to to hear a little bit about your strategy for uh, you know ensuring safety uh, and communicating that to the to the public. Uh, thank you for the question, Council Member Rallo. Um, we, we've had a really, really difficult, I'd say, year and a half um, in our parks. And um, from the you reports, the phone calls, the emails, um, staff interactions, um, the cost of repairing, uh, vandalism, um, and, and genuine concern um, for these public spaces has just been on the increase, just overwhelming. Um, so taking a lot of time working closely with other city departments, uh, public works, uh, BPD, the DROs, the social workers, our health and wellness coordinator is, um, works very, very closely um, with the DROs. Um, and so again, I reference, you know, opening and making our parks open and safe and available for everyone. So our strategy um, in the past several months has been um, an increased presence. Um, we were to the point where our, our seasonal staff were spending all of their time um, in repairs or cleaning up messes or trash and all of that. So we um, have expanded our Centerstone partnership agreement. Uh, we now have um, attendance in uh, restrooms at Switchyard Park. We got some additional funding through the CARES Act to hire additional what we call park monitors um, in Switchyard Park and along the D-Line Trail. So just having more um, eyes out on, on, on those spaces. We also um, have contracted private security um, which is really helping with the after hours from 11 p.m. to 5 a.m and um, is allowing us to see there's, there's a lot of activity after hours, uh, but they are successfully moving people along who are in the parks um, after hours. I can just quickly tell you, they stopped a couple of motorbikes that were speeding down the Beeline Trail the other night through Switchyard Park. So, you know, had they not been there, we don't know how that would have turned out. So we're seeing some early results. Vandalism seems to be down, but again, uh, that is our strategy uh, so that our seasonal staff can do their jobs during the day and keeping our parks clean, safe, and um, available. Thank you for that very thorough answer. Um, okay, going to, I think we're still on first or second round. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Ah, there's a question. Councilman Rosenberg. Thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation. I, I just wanted to follow up on Councilmember Piedmont Smith's question. I got a little confused, I think, um, with the Cascades Road Project. Um, is this right that it was in the transportation plan to put in a bike path through Cascades and that we could convert the road to bike ped, um, but we're opting to fix the damage and that cost millions of dollars and then um, we're not putting in a bike path 
and we're just opting to slow the traffic. Is that right? Um, to, to clarify, um, it's in, yes, it's in the transportation plan, but it's also been in the parks and recreation, the, the whole lower cascade area. That is a very challenging piece of road through there with the curves, the, the, the minimal shoulders. Um, we did have a consultant yeah. come in and give some options for it. And we took a look at that. There was a survey that was done and it was 50-50 split, whether we should leave it open or provide a side path and that connection. Um, and we elected to conduct the pilot project to fully close it and see what that experience was, was like for people. Because of that, that pilot and the feedback that we received, we opted to reopen the road with these enhancements. Um, it is not a million dollar project. It, um, right now we have a paving contract for 160,000 um, that includes the uh, speed cushions in that. We'll be doing some signage down there, making a safe crosswalk, adding some guardrails and some lighting down there. I don't have all the costs of that because it's, it's still in the planning, getting quotes stages of that. Um, but it's, it's to create this, this use and, and we'll put it out there and, and get the reaction and, and, and see how it goes. It's the door is not closed, but we definitely want to create this new experience, which is what we got from our, our pilot project. Thank you, following up on that. Did, um, I'm just stuck on the, you know, the point that the, this city and residents agree that the plan made sense, you know, and we have the transportation plan. Um, was there a consideration of making it one lane and adding a bike path so that the transportation plan, you know, Get followed, or um, was that I don't know? Was that considered? That that was considered, yes. Um, and there was a lot of um, public feedback on how that would work and whether it would be closed north or whether it would be closed south. And again, um, the the over the overwhelming feedback that that we received and what we felt was the right thing to do was to meet halfway and reopen it with, with this new new enhancement and, and new experience. Thank okay, uh, that completes the, the time, but uh, let's see, Councilmember Flaherty, you have another question. Uh, yes, just a quick follow-up on the same subject, uh, and really something uh, you said, Ms. McDevitt, uh, I think in reply to my original question, or maybe Councilmember Piedmont-Smith's. Um, did you mention that, so, so, so the money that was allocated under Resolution 1822, uh, was $2.1 million for a 1.2 mile path from Clubhouse Drive to College Avenue. Um, did, were, were you saying that some of that 2.1 million was spent on an accessible trail instead, one of the trails um, that's being added uh, in elsewhere in Cascades Park? Is that, is that, was that correct? Correct, correct. And uh, uh, if Mr. Underwood wants to jump in on um, how that happened or why that was decided. Uh, I, I understood, yeah, it was the, the bond, okay. bond council advised mm -hmm. uh, that that was uh, uh, legally permissible. Is that is that yes. accurate? Okay, thank you. Just wanted to make sure I understood that. Yes, uh-huh. Thank you. Um, further questions? Councilmember Volan. Yes, briefly. Um, can you give us at least a rough figure of the new um, cost of the changes to the road and lower cascades i mean it's, it's 160 for paving but it's not a million is it around half a million or less or more can you give us a ballpark? um gosh I, I i would i would be happy to provide that i'm reluctant to to throw out a figure um but i can i i can provide that for you is it is it more than half a million dollars i don't believe so okay thank you Okay. Um, any other questions? I had uh, I had one remaining, uh, Ms. McDevitt, and that was um, you had a target for ninety six percent use of of the community gardens space. Uh, so I'm always looking for opportunities for urban agriculture. Um, we have a high rental population that doesn't have access to a yard to grow food. Um, 
Has there been talk about expanding our uh, community gardens? Um, you know, it could be that our, our community garden staff has talked about it and we'll find it if, if they are, it could be in their strategic action plan to, to tell you um, before 2020, we were not selling out our garden, garden plots. We were mm. below capacity. We were doing things mid season, like 50% off. I mean, really trying at, at all of our garden locations, Butler, uh, Willie Streeter, and of course, Switchyard wasn't open yet. So it made us kind of nervous because we had all these garden plots planned for Switchyard Park. Well, you know, with, with the pandemic, um, with the incredible, what I think is a wonderful design of community gardens at Switchyard Park. We sold out last year because people were looking to be out and it was definitely a, a needed resource. Um, and we sold out so quickly this year that uh, we pulled the information from our summer program guide because we didn't have any more garden plots left. So it's a new, it's, it, it's a new good problem to have and um, one that I, I will definitely share your thoughts with our, our community garden staff. Okay, wonderful. Um, well, I like the trend. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, so do and, we. Well, and, and the other consideration is, you know, some, some of the gardens um, aren't always accessible to people, aren't always, you know, nearby. And so, if you know, they're distributed more in the city, you know, that might be part of the, the planning. Mm -hmm. But, um, okay, if there are no other questions, I uh, don't see any more, then we will go to the public on the 2022 budget for Parks and Recreation. Um, Mr. Lucas, do we have any interest so far? Yes, uh, I see one hand raised. And uh, before uh, going to uh, public comment, if, if there are others that would want to speak, uh, please use the raise hand function to do so uh, or type a message into chat to let us know uh, you'd like to comment. Uh, first up is Greg Alexander. Mr. Alexander, you have two minutes. Great. Um, thank you. I, I got to start out by saying I really love our recreational facilities. Last year, a few of my favorites were closed, but they reopened this summer, and I really appreciated that. The city's Parks and Rec Department really does a great job for recreation. But man, Three years ago, Parks and Rec came to council with a bond package. They'd split it up into three different bonds because if they'd had it as one bond, the size of it would have triggered a greater public review. And then they sorted the projects between the bonds. There was no way for the council to vote for the bike and ped transportation projects without also voting for a bunch of amenities for parks. I love our parks, but their choices worked against your ability to set priorities. And then for one of the bonds, they allocated $2 million to provide a bike and ped connection from the Cascades Trail to existing transportation facilities. And that didn't happen. I'm not saying their reasons are bad, but the simple fact of the matter is that was taxpayer money that was allocated for a specific purpose. It is so rare to see money allocated meaningfully for transportation. And, and that didn't happen here, despite what they, they told you guys three years ago. I honestly don't know what you should do. It seems to me like it's blatant insubordination, a renegade department perpetrating a fraud against taxpayers. It's a significant test of your authority. I really have no idea. I, I don't know how you can govern when this sort of conduct occurs. But at least I know this. You absolutely need to remove all bike and ped transportation responsibility from Parks and Rec. Their priority is recreation, and they do a great job at, at it. But our city's comprehensive plan makes clear these facilities should be for transportation. They're spending transportation dollars on recreation. They ignore transportation engineering standards, and they ignore transportation planning priorities. Don't take my word for it. And for goodness sake, don't take Director McDevitt's word for it. Get a transportation planner or engineer in here and ask them. Thank you. Okay, let's uh, move on to, do we have more public? Don't see any additional requests uh, for comment. Okay, let's just wait a moment. Okay, seeing none, we'll come back to council for any additional questions or comment. Uh, council member Scambaluri. Actually, I Final comments, but I'll defer to questions first. Uh, uh, Councilmember Flaherty, did you have a comment or question? Also comment. Okay, let's start with uh, Councilmember Scambaluri. Sure, thank you. Um, 
You and your staff are amazing, Ms. McDevitt. Thank you for all the good work you do. Congratulations on the gold medal. Congratulations on the accreditation, well-deserved. Um, obviously, I followed Lower Cascades pretty closely. Um, as much of it as it attracted citywide attention, but it happens to be in the district I represent. So of course I paid close attention to that. Um, one of the things I want to observe, if the last 18 months have taught us anything, it's taught us that issues are revisited, okay? Annexation stopped for a while and came back. The UDO stopped for a while and came back with this new council. Ditto zoning. All right. Um, I acknowledge the plans and the values laid out in those plans, but I also believe that how we implement those plans should be informed by the evolving needs of this community and by the feedback we get from our taxpayers. And in the case of Lower Cascades, a lot of taxpayers showed up and a lot of taxpayers debated. Um, I can't, I lost count of the number of constituent meetings that Ms. McDevitt and her staff attended, uh, including one that I think attracted probably 60 or 70 people in Lower Cascades. Um, those taxpayers had their voices heard and I appreciate all of it you did to listen to constituents. Um, so at a time when we seem to be revisiting many issues, uh, I thank you for knowing, for taking the time to again, implement plans in a way that is informed by the evolving needs of our community and the feedback we get that may be new. Um, I will happily support this budget. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Flaherty. Sure, thank you. Um, thank you, Ms. McDevitt for answering questions and for the presentation and for all the work you and your department do. Um, I'm excited and interested to follow up on, on the um, electric uh, equipment conversion and learn more about that. Um, I remain disappointed at, at the decisions of, of your department and the administration uh, with regard to Resolution 1822, the bicentennial bonds that were approved by the council. Um, I, I honestly just don't find it acceptable that the administration unilaterally decided to disregard those bonds, even if we thought it was legally permissible somehow in a narrow sense. Uh, the whereas clauses in the resolution literally say a trail from Clubhouse Drive to College Avenue at Cascades Park. Um, Similarly, uh, I find it unacceptable that we had the administration unilaterally decide to ignore an adopted transportation plan that this council adopted. Um, it also is concerning that that seemed to be the case with some TDM plans and climate plans earlier this evening. Uh, we are very limited in our powers on the council. It's, I know many of my colleagues have found it difficult and frustrating at times um, how little power we have in relation to the mayor and his team, and, and that's fine. It's the strong mayor system we have in Indiana. Uh, but where we, where we do have authority is adopting plans for the city that frankly, I expect that we are gonna follow. Um, and same thing with approving bonds. It's really troubling to me uh, how that decision was made. That the council wasn't involved, that we're ignoring our plans and documents. I, I can't support this budget because we're not following what we said we were going to do. I need to see money in this budget to complete what we didn't do with the bond money when we spent it on something else. Um, it, it's a really troubling pattern and, and I'm, I'm pretty disappointed. Uh, so I'll be voting no tonight, thank you. Further council comment? Council member Sandberg. Thank you. Um, I, I must support um, Councilmember Scambolori's position here. Um, she is my district rep. I live in District 2, even though I serve at large. And I can certainly back her up uh, with all of the public um, um, uh, concern uh, that their understanding was the closure of the Lower Cascades was a pilot project that could be revisited in, in, in what, two years? Um, and being in a landlocked neighborhood, which we are here in Matlock and Blue Ridge, um, people who were finding themselves limited during a pandemic were standing up and speaking for accessibility issues and individuals who are not able to bike and are not, are not able to be 
pedestrians as we, we hope and, and encourage all of our residents to be. But we found some real pushback from the community that, that is limited in those abilities and who do want to enjoy the, um, the um, more passive uh, park areas in our community. And so Council Member Scambalori was listening to her constituents in District 2. I certainly heard it too. Um, and so I, I think we all need to be a little bit more flexible in understanding that as facts change and as circumstances change, we need to be a little more reasonable in our abilities to change as well and not hold people accountable to some sort of, 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 of study or some sort of plan when we have many, many plans with a lot of movable parts in them, and some of them we choose to follow, some of, some of them we don't. We went through that with our comprehensive plan not that long ago with the UDO. Um, and so that is just the nature of the beast. We can't always have ex things exactly as we want them when we're listening to our public who have a right to weigh in as well. So again, I, I will support um, Ms. McDevitt in her efforts and her board and their decisions as well as the taxpayers that did, did, did very, very clearly indicate that they were not happy with that closure. So, and, and again, my thanks to you, Paula, the park that I visit the most frequently is the Ferguson Dog Park, and you're doing a very fine job in keeping that well-maintained. Thank you. Yeah. Further council comment, the Parks and Rec budget. Uh, Councilman Rosenberger. Thank you. Thank you, Director McDevitt, for your presentation, and thank you for the work that you do. Um, I will say on, on this budget, I plan to vote no right now. I really think I could not agree with Council Member Flaherty more on this one. I, I'm just really not on board with changing the plan for Cascades Park. I don't mean that the plan says it needs to be bike pads only, but the plan definitely says there needs to be a multi-use path. So I, I understand that the, the road closure was a pilot project, but I don't see that we're meeting, we're meeting in the middle by offering traffic calming. It's just really not the best solution here. And I think halfway would actually be half the road dedicated to bike pad and half the road dedicated to cars. I think the entire road dedicated to cars is really not not changing anything. So um, that's that is really hard for me to get behind. I think it is, um, I guess I call it funny or comical, to have adopted plans that the entire city voted on, agreed on, had public comment on, and then when it comes time to implement that plan, some people are uncomfortable with it. But that's just not what we agreed on, right? Like we agreed that we were going to make these changes. I also think it's very normal that the people we that need change the most are not the people that tend to be able to comment at these meetings. You know, our city is 80,000 people. And I don't know how many you heard from in, in the public comment period, but you know, I just think it's important that we consider everyone when we are, you know, talking about our, our plan. So I'm also unsure of the evolving need that council members discussed in for this. I mean, during COVID, if anything, people are driving less. So people are working at home more, people are staying at home more. So I guess I don't understand the need to drive through Cascades Park more when everyone has an alternative route to get home or get to the park. So that's hard for me. Um, for now, I'm a no on this budget. I would love to see a plan that, a budget for this that includes paying for what we said we would pay for in this park. I just, it's a, yeah, this is just like an unfortunate occurrence to me. Thank you. Additional public comment, uh, sorry, council comment. Uh, Councilmember Volan, is your hand up? Yes. Okay. Proceed. Well, this is interesting. Councilmember Scambaleri and Sandberg have both now directly addressed the director of at least two presenting departments. So if the rest of us don't also keep praise on staff, it makes us look 
I don't know, uncharitable or impersonal, or perhaps that we uh, don't like the department head, they should know and it should be pointed out. This is a kind of pandering. It's a political act. Uh, I also heard the quote, plans should be informed by the evolving needs of the community and feedback from taxpayers. Taxpayers. Councilmember Scambaluri also equated taxpayers to constituents. Not all constituents are taxpayers. In fact, many of those constituents who don't pay taxes are the kind of people who would use a trail in Lower Cascades. Uh, this is a consumerist model of government. It shouldn't only be what taxpayers think. It should be what everybody thinks. Taxpayers are not the entirety of our constituents. I remember in my first term, second term, pointing out the entirety of chapter six of the previous comprehensive plan, which we called the growth policies plan, the GPP, is called mitigate traffic. I remember hearing my former colleague, Councilor Mayor, dismiss my insistence on following it by saying that we didn't have to follow every plan to the letter. Well, I've heard that again tonight. We don't have to hear it, follow every plan to the letter. I do recall though that not too long ago this year when missing middle housing came before us, these same colleagues who don't wanna follow our plans now were adamant that we follow certain other aspects of our plans to the letter. It's not that we can't follow plans to the letter, it's that certain members are arbitrary in their choices and they just don't wanna follow the parts of the plans they don't like. I too have a great deal of respect for the work of the Parks Department. I'm proud of the two gold medals it's earned the second under its current director, who does a good job. I think most of this budget is fine, but I object to the way that Lower, lower Cascades was considered. It is a fundamental part. It's a, it's a budget question. We are talking about the budget. Once again, I cannot vote for this budget tonight. And I would urge my colleagues to consider uh, the, uh, what's the word, collegiality of this body. Thank you. Uh, further council comment? I'm not seeing any, so I'll, I'll conclude by um, saying that I, I think uh, your, your work, uh, Ms. McDevitt is exemplary, uh, winning awards and uh, working to uh, establish policies that um, reflect the, the needs and desires of the, of the public. Um, I'm very pleased that a number of things, and I, I won't go into all of them, but uh, I'm, I'm very happy about focus on native plantings and trees, brief restoration, um, and particularly, I just wanna commend again, Ms. Swift's work on planters downtown, which I think is a very uh, bold thing to do, um, but I think is quite beautiful and uh, I think works well as a demonstration project. Um, however, I, I will be passing tonight because I, I want to determine more about the process um, by which uh, an expectation of the council was modified. And um, I, I'd like to explore that some more and find out because that, that was a major expectation. So um, I, will, I will be passing on this budget uh, in lieu of more information. So with that, do we have a recommendation? Move to pass on the part of the budget. Second. Okay. okay, we have a recommendation second. Uh, Councilmember Volan, you're first. Sorry, wait, I did. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, no. Councilmember Scambaluri. Yes. Councilmember Sandberg. Yes. Uh, Councilmember Flaherty. No. Councilmember Rosenberger. No. Um, Councilmember Smith. Yes. Councilmember Piedmont Smith. Pass. Councilmember Sims. Yes. And I will pass as well. Uh, so we have a recommendation on the Parks and Recs uh, 2022 budget of four yes, three no, and two pass. Thank you, Director McDevitt.
Appreciate Thank your you. presentation. All right, let's proceed now to our final um, budget this evening, and that is the budget of the city of city clerk of Bloomington, Nicole Bolden. Uh, good evening, Ms. Bolden. Thank you for your patience. It's been a long evening. Um, are you ready and would you like to begin? Um, yes, thank you. I, I believe I am ready okay. and, um, and I, I will begin. So if you'll give me just a moment. Sure. And so hopefully we have our screen shared right now. Yes. I'm sorry, I couldn't. I think Council Member Scambler, you gave me a thumbs up, yeah. so I'm going to go with yeah. you. I turned my mic off, sorry. Uh, it, yes, all good to go. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. So, um, thank you. Actually, I want to begin by thanking you all for allowing me to reschedule my presentation. Um, so, to begin with, why we exist. The Office of the City Clerk is defined by statute and practice. We sit outside the city administration and beside the Common Council, both literally and statutorial, statutorily. Um, our duties are set out in the Indiana Code. And we have, we have a, it is a full-time elected position, city clerk. And I currently have a chief deputy city clerk, Sophia McDowell, who is wonderful. And I know you all are all very familiar with her. And a deputy city clerk, um, Susan Stoll, who's also wonderful. And they're both authorized to perform all the duties that the Indiana Code and the Bloomington Municipal Code delegate to the clerk. Our major initiatives are listed here. Um, but we serve as the official record keeper for the council. We officiate marriages, attest to signatures, administer oaths, certify documents. We sign official deeds and documents, prepare or arrange for public notices to be published. We also serve as a satellite voter registration office. We update and maintain the Bloomington Municipal Code. We coordinate recruitment for city boards and commissions, which is very familiar because you've gotten multiple emails from us saying, hey, we need to get together and do this. And we preserve the records of the council, which if you ever come into the office for members of the public, you can see our original documents for the city, which is where we keep our city charter. Um, we have been charged by judicial order to adjudicate parking ticket appeals for the city of Bloomington, which is how sometimes, unfortunately, most members of the public first come in contact with our office. And we collaborate with entities within the city and outside of the city to provide opportunities to discuss local government, encourage civic engagement, and really participate in areas of civic life. So jumping ahead, our budget goals don't really change that often in the office of the city clerk because we're so confined with what we do. So we want to continue to staff the shared office. We want to continue to provide staff for, well, we actually want to and will <laughs> by code, um, staff council committee meetings and we'll continue to do memos and minutes for all of those minutes for meetings for approval. We will, um, we will continue to attend classes and trainings in order to, ach to achieve certification. And I do wanna to touch on this. In 2019, the Indiana Code was changed to add additional continuing educational trainings for the office. So there are two types of training certification that, are, that we can achieve. One is the Indiana Accredited Municipal Clerk and the other at least at one level is the certified municipal clerk. So I've actually achieved both of, both of those designations. Um, the next one I can achieve is a master municipal clerk. Those take years to actually acquire. So I don't anticipate actually getting the next level before at least 2023, but um, 
Sophia and Susan are both working on those themselves. And then public engagement and outreach. So we're going to continue to officiate weddings. We're going to continue to attend neighborhood and community meetings and sponsor activities and events that will benefit the community and reflect our city goals. And for the fun part, which is what we really came to talk about, which is what our budget is going to look like this year. Um, the bulk of our budget increase is in personnel services this year. Um, and it's related to a requested salary increase that is in line with citywide staff and our request to add one full-time position in the clerk's office. And this position is intended to assist with ongoing duties within our office. And having that additional clerk will allow for greater, sorry, greater flexibility within the clerk's office and will ensure that all of our statutory duties are fulfilled. So this budget request reflects the full cost of the annual, annual salary and benefits related to this position. And I believe that our workload has increased sufficiently over the last few years to warrant the request. There's also a small item request in um, category three of about $191, just to pinpoint that. I haven't really asked for many increases over the last few years in categories two or three. So that's a bit unusual. And I wanted to make sure that you were aware of that. And here are the numbers for you if you wanted to look at them again. And that is my budget presentation in a nutshell. And I am ready for any questions that you have for me this evening. Thank you, Clerk Bolton. You're welcome. Um, so we'll now go to council questions for our city clerk um, who would like to begin. Are there any questions? Council member Volan. Yeah, uh, Madam Clerk, can you discuss at all um, uh, how the duties of, I mean, I know that in the Hamilton administration and with the, this term and the previous term of council, we've taken on a lot more work. There've been a lot more meetings we've been doing with plans and uh, UDO and other big piece of legislation. How has that affected your office? Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, I would say um, if you go back about 10 years, so starting in 2011, you used to average at about 54, 55 meetings a year. And starting when I came in office, so in 2016, that year, there were about 69 meetings. The next year were 54. And then the meetings have steadily gone up. So last year, you had 99 meetings. And yes, that was the first year you had committee meetings. But this year, where you've had relatively few committee meetings, if any, you've had 59 meetings so far. And you have an additional uh, you're on track to do about 84 meetings by the end of this year. And um, that's without scheduling any additional special sessions. And I am, I'm pretty sure that there might be one or two additional meetings coming up this year. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Um, we well, I guess, I mean, sorry, that that's, go ahead. So um, we were trying to chart it out and we were, we were really looking at it. I can show you kind of a, a very rough chart that we drew up earlier, but it is bottom line, the workload has increased. The meetings have become more frequent. The meetings have become longer. And um, those are just the meetings. We've also increased our coverage in the office where the council staff and the clerk staff used to actually split coverage in the office at the front desk. Now my staff of two actually is responsible for covering the full 45 hours in the work week that our office is open as opposed to splitting it with council staff, which means we're also covering that. So if I were to break my request down for additional staff, I would say <clears throat> we have more office hours that we're covering, we have more staff meetings that we're covering, and we have fewer staff members than we did ever before. 
and your staff is not salaried. So every extra hour they have to work overtime is uh, our, it increases your overtime budget. That is correct, but we have no budget for overtime. Okay, good to know. Thank you. You're correct. Yeah. Additional comment or questions? Pardon me. It's been a long night. Uh, Councilmember Flaherty. Yes, thank you, Clerk Bolden, for the presentation. Uh, following up on the same thread of the, the idea of a new employee, um, can you speak maybe a little bit to some of the things that have been harder to, to fit in outside of core duties that will be easier to achieve with an expanded staff? Um, I'm, I'm just thinking in particular, I guess, like I, I have no doubt that your office has been strained um, and, and has a, a hard time meeting the demands uh, placed on it. Um, and just thinking if it's hard to probably quantify exactly how much additional hours are needed. I'm sure you've <laughs> gone through that exercise in some, in some fashion. Uh, but just thinking if we have another full-time employee, um, will that even kind of free up some time for others to do things? And what, what types of activities would those be that maybe you're having a hard time fulfilling now? I want to make sure that I answer your question correctly, but um, let me just give you a quick example or maybe a couple of quick examples. Recently, the council wanted to schedule an additional session and we simply, clerk staff was not available to do so. Um, so we were really straining to find time where there was somebody who was available to be, to cover the staff to staff your council meeting. And that was difficult. Or I had a death in my family and had to attend a funeral. My staff couldn't cover my budget presentation, so I'm here this evening to do so. But because of that, staff had to shuffle around and we ended up short staffed. And there was some PTO involved because they ended up covering the meeting on Monday night. So then somebody else had to cover it today and we'll end up short staffed on Friday. So everybody's going to end up working and covering it where else. And somebody's not gonna end up with a lunch on Friday. So we're going to end up missing time to cover some basic issues like breaks, lunches, PTO that has to be missed or shifted. And there's a real quality of life issue that comes up when you have a very, very small staff trying to cover a large number of hours. This is just something that has to be done. Thank you. Further questions for the city clerk on her budget request? I have one, uh, Clerk Bolden, and that is um, you've been working quite diligently for the last few years on um, catching up on minutes that were left uh, undone uh, before your, you, you began your tenure. Um, and I wondered what, how we are doing on the progress. I see that it, we, we're steadily getting there, but um, are, are, we, are we getting close or uh, are um, there many more? <laughs> well, we were doing okay, but um, as we got more duties on our end, we actually started to fall behind on our own work. So I wanted to make sure that we didn't fall too far behind on our current work as well. So, okay. and this is actually part of our request, which is we... Um, we need to make sure that we don't fall too far behind on our current work. So we have a lot of minutes that we have in our queue for you all to approve um, finishing up with 2020 and into 2021. So please don't be surprised when you see those coming in your packets over the next few months. And then we have all the minutes um, going back you know, over the last few years and that's an ongoing project. Um, mm -hmm. It's, we're working on it. And okay. I, I do hope to have as many of them completed before the end of my term, because I'd like the city records to be as complete as possible. Okay, thank you. Uh, are there any other questions? Seeing none. Oh, there's oh, one. There's one. 
Councilman Riscambolari. Thank you, sorry. Um, I meant to ask this earlier and I didn't, but are there any ways in which you would recommend we benchmark ourselves against other cities when it comes to staffing in clerk's offices? Is, are there cities we compare ourselves to? Are there professional re recommendations of professional societies for adequate staffing or anything like that? <laughs> um, I, I, that's uh, difficult. You know, I'm a member of the uh, Indiana League of Municipal Clerks and Treasurers. So I do talk to other clerks from second class cities on a regular basis. I'm also on the board of director, board of directors for AIM, which is the Association of Indiana Municipalities. So I do talk to other municipalities um, as often as I can. Bloomington tends to be somewhat different in terms of how we're structured and um, how we operate. And I, I believe, I, I don't wanna put words in anybody's mouth. I think it was council member Sandberg once who said that Bloomington is different or maybe you said special, I don't remember. Um, but <laughs> it's so it, it's hard to say that we will operate just like this city because we just don't. Okay. And, and, I, and it I, sounds like there are no guidelines from professional associations either. No, and there are no direct parallels. I, I went, when I first got elected, I went to a few of the other second class cities to see how they operated and what some of the better practices would be um, to put in, that we could do in our offices. And um, they're all a little different. Like the duties are just a little bit different and it, you mm -hmm. know, Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Further, uh, Councilmember Flaherty. Thank you. Um, I did have two other small ones. Uh, one was, I don't remember the exact history of, of when and, and reasons for why the council and the clerk's office uh, stopped sharing the staffing responsibilities with the front desk and it, and it went to the clerk's office. Um, and we don't necessarily have to get into that or we could uh, if you wanted to or we could chat later. But uh, my question was actually, um, is, is the plan then for the foreseeable future for the clerk's office to continue staffing the, the front desk in, in that office, shared office full time? If, if this position was approved, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Um, so very short history and I believe um, those who were around at the time and part of the council leadership can help me if I misstate anything, but um, the council staff who was around at the time asked if the clerk's office would take over the staffing of the office full time, which we agreed to provided that if it became too much, we could get additional staff, um, which is what I'm asking for. I would have asked for it a, a couple of years ago, but there were a few things that intervened in the meantime. And Will we continue to staff the front desk if we get additional staff? Yes, that is part of the reason why I'm asking, because that is, you know, that was part of the agreement, which is we would continue to staff it if we had that staff. Okay, thank you. And and your assessment of the additional person hours needed uh, leads to concluding a full time employee is needed, and a part time employee would not get you get your office there. Is that right? I'm sorry, can you repeat that question? Uh, based on sort of the, the, the things that are hard to cover right now, the anticipated um, person hours that would be needed to cover full duties for the clerk's office, um, your conclusion is that you would need a full-time employee to meet those and a part-time employee would not um, get your department back to a sustainable place. Is that is that right? Yeah, my predecessor actually had 2.75 um, employees in the two years prior to my term beginning and still had work unfinished. So no, I think at least three would be the bare minimum. Okay, thank you. And less work at the time, so. Any other questions? I'm seeing none. So we will go now to. There's 
one the, more question. There is? Why am I missing them? Who is that? Oh, Councilman Rosenberger, sorry. I'm sorry, I try to put it in front of my face since I am blurred as well. Um, oh, there we go. Um, just one follow up, I guess. I, I mean, I think this sounds fine. Um, do you think part of this is like the pandemic and would it make sense to, you know, revisit in a few years if we go back to some kind of non-emergency state, get caught up on minutes? I don't know. Um, I don't think that's something that we would like put into this budget, right? But just a, just a question, I guess, if there's a period of time where you think it might quiet down. I understand the question and um, I would have asked for the staff member probably back, and I considered actually asking for this additional staff member back in 2018 or 19, to be honest, and I didn't at that time. So this had nothing to do with the pandemic. Um, the pandemic actually gave us some relief because we were able to telecommute a great deal. So some of the stressors of covering the office full time were eased and there was a greater, greater flexibility in terms of staffing the office because members of the public were not able to come into City Hall completely. So that actually was um, something that made a difference. Now, we were also working longer hours in a different way, but it, it just, it shifted the way that we were covering the office. So. No, I don't think it was something that was caused by the pandemic, but I appreciate the question. And I, I don't mind revisiting it over time, but I think it's a wise thing to do. But it's, it's something I, I thought about pretty carefully because I, I don't like asking for money unless I really have to. Okay. If I, there are no other questions, I don't see any, but we can always come back after public comment. So, Mr. Lucas, do we have any public comment on the clerk's budget for 2022? We have one raised we, hand, it looks like. We do, yes, just one moment. Uh, first up is uh, Natalia Galvin. Galvin, sorry, uh, who should now be able to comment. Ms. Galvin, uh, thank you, and you have two minutes. Hi, thank you. My name is Natalia Galvin, and I'm a resident of District. I'm commenting specifically in support of Clerk Bolden's request for another full-time staff member. Uh, very recently, I started attending county commissioner meetings to advocate for increased election central space. That has shown me how much I prefer the accessibility and transparency of city council meetings. The clerk's role is a big part of that. I took a cursory look at the past 33 city council meeting times in 2021 from CATS, and my quick math estimates that the average city council meeting is about three hours and 38 minutes long. With the considerable issues that city council addresses and will continue to address in the future, I do not foresee meetings becoming shorter or residents becoming less engaged. It is crucial that our clerk staff is not overwhelmed or burned out. In addition to meetings, the clerk staff has always been very helpful with finding out more information about boards and commissions that is not readily available. Finally, I had the privilege of serving on the Housing and Security Working Group this past spring. As part of that work, I reached out to different cities, and part of that work required me to look through their city council minutes to find out more information about funding. It was a rarity when I could find any digital city council archive, let alone one as thorough as ours in Bloomington. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you for your comment, Ms. Gelwin. Do we have any other interested public in commenting? See no, uh, no more hands raised at the moment. I'll just uh, remind folks if they'd like to comment, they can use the raise hand feature uh, or uh, send a message uh, via chat to let us know you'd like to comment that way. Don't see any additional requests. Okay. 
So we're back to council for any additional questions or a final comment and recommendation. Uh, council member Sandberg. I'm ready to comment, not question if anybody would like to uh, jump ahead with another question. Any, any questions? No, please proceed. Uh, council member Sandberg. Well, I, I certainly appreciate this appeal and especially the notation of how our meetings have increased over this past term. Um, I feel it. Uh, so I know Clerk Bolden, her staff feel it too. So I do not begrudge her this additional position because they are tasked in a sense, uh, working day where, the, where they're primarily interfacing with members of the public. And then at night when they're dealing with all of us, and so um, I, I, I think we should all uh, question this because anytime you add a new FTE, there's always the danger that, you know, when times get, we have to t tighten our belts, we may have to reduce staff, which is always unfortunate. But I don't see the meetings getting any less frequent. Um, we certainly have been through a lot with UDO and comp plans, and now we're heading into annexation. And... Uh, life is going to continue to be interesting, I think, for some time ahead. And so, again, I will be supporting uh, the budget and uh, happily to do so, given all the support that the clerk and her staff give to this council. Thank you. Further comments? Uh, uh, Councilmember Scambaluri. Thank you. Uh, Sorry, I don't mean to be flippant, just trying to get attention. Um, I'm gonna be passing on this request tonight only because I have a couple more questions about office structure and I wanna make sure I'm understanding things correctly. Um, but I found what you shared, I found what Clerk Bolden shared about um, the number of meetings and the length of meetings and how what that trajectory looks like over time to be very compelling. Uh, so that's very helpful information, I'm grateful for that. So thanks. Very good. Uh, other comments? Councilmember Volan. Just want to say I agree with everything Councilmember Sandberg said about this budget. Thank you. Okay. If there's no other comment, then I will have my comment, which is um, I think back to Councilmember Skimbaluri's question. I, I remember looking at legislative. Um, loads of other councils around the state, and I think we probably lead the pack. So uh, we do more, um, at least we, we do a lot more legislation. I don't know if we get more done, but, uh, and so we add to that workload that is probably not comparative to, to other city clerks. Um, I think this council's added to the workload of the clerk's office uh, in the past couple of years. And so uh, I feel obligated to support the clerk uh, in, in this budget request. Um, I think that, uh, and owing to the fact that um, the, of the office duties that they have assumed as well, she has assumed. So I'll be supporting it. Um, do we have a recommendation? Move to pass. Second. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Volan. Yes. Councilmember Scambalori. Abstain. Councilmember Sandberg. Yes. Councilmember Smith. Yes. Councilmember Flaherty. Yes. Councilmember Rosenbarger. Yes. And I vote yes. And Councilmember Piedmont Smith is absent. So that is a vote of. Um, Six, four, and one abstention. So is that correct? No. I don't yeah. believe you called my name. Council, uh, Council President Sims, how did I miss you? I know, I know. Yes. There you are. <laughs> I was going down the line, that's why. <laughs> I know. It's Thank late. Thank you all very it much. Is. Thank you, Clerk Bolden. I appreciate it. So that is that concludes our business this evening for departmental budget hearings. And we'll have another one tomorrow uh, at 6 p.m. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor? 
Bye. Bye. We don't do that anymore. Good night, everyone.